Okay. It's the CES meeting. It's January 18th of 2023. We have a couple of topics leading into plenary this coming week or weeks, I don't recall. Um, but uh, the, the first of which is that it seems that we've come to um, happy compromises, happy enough compromises for both async disposal and for async context. Um, and to start us off, I'd like to give the floor to Matthew to talk about async disposal. Yeah. Um, so at the plenary, we had raised or concern with um, the async parts of the uh, resource disposal proposal uh, that Ron is championing, uh, mostly around the lack of syntactic uh, points for interleaving when, so when uh, you exit the block, as originally proposed when you exit the block, uh, the resources added uh, during the block using uh, the using statement um, would have been, uh, there would have been an await interleaving point at the, the, the block exits. And uh, that's a difference from what happens currently in, uh, in the language where any asynchronous interleaving point is uh, demarcated by an await keyword. Um, so following a discussion on the side of the last plenary on matrix um the argument was put forward that this kind of uh syntactic requirements can be substituted by uh linting uh and basically if the the, the linter could realize that there is a so for anyone that is concerned about these uh is uh, awaiting uh, interleaving. Uh, the a linter can help and tooling can help show where those uh, those are and eventually require uh, some comment based uh, uh, syntax to 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 show where those would occur. Um, so we did agree with that assessment that uh, and and so this was in combination also with our programming style where we actually do uh, disallow nested awaits. Uh, so await statements that are not in the top level of an async function or in the top level of the four await of block. Um, so in, in our case, we would most likely dis uh, disallow uh, any using uh, statement like that that don't have the same placement. So the tooling uh, wouldn't change or would, wouldn't change dramatically. Um, so here is the PR that uh, Ron put up, uh, where basically um, any using a weight statement that is evaluated within the block will end up causing uh, a interleaving point at the block exits, even regardless of the value uh, of the binding. So that means if there is a break statement or any kind of conditional exit of the block, uh, before the using statement is reached, there won't be any awaiting at the end of the block, but there will be a, an awaiting at the end of the block, regardless of the value of the binding, if the statement is evaluated. Uh, and, let me, let me, and let me just confirm, that includes a throw. If a throw happens before the first using await, uh, then there's also no await on, the, on yeah. processing the throw. Okay. I, I, basically, if the statement is not evaluated, there is no in, implicit interleaving. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that is the proposal. Uh, Ron is uh, proposing this with going back to the using await syntax. For some time, we had uh, suggested that async using was a better uh, approach, but that was in the context of having an explicit await marker at the end of the block. Uh, since we're moving away from that, uh, we believe it will be clear. It would be clearer with uh, using awaits as the syntax because uh, the await keyword being used suggests that there will be an interleaving point, uh, maybe not on this line, but on another line. Um, however, we're not going to block if we end up going uh, for async using either uh, as well. There are some other champions um, suggesting that async using is a better uh, fit. Um, and that is pretty much it. 
by yielding the floor. All right. Oh, thank you, Matthew. I think that that is a very happy conclusion. Um, the uh, the other topic is uh, following on from the last couple of weeks. We have a little bit of follow up on async context, and I think uh, a tentative happy conclusion. Um, and Justin and Mark previously had a conversation through uh, an intermediate meeting. So let's just follow on from that and uh, close that topic out for now. Mark, are you back at your computer yet? Um, or are you uh, able to, I, to talk about I, it if I present? Uh, if you present, I can talk about it. Okay. I'm, not at my, I'm not at my computer yet. Um, so I'm currently, I, I, I think you can see, right? Uh, yes, you're presenting the, the rewrite slide. Good. Yeah. Okay. So there's a... Um, a, a previous uh, bit of language history that, um, that this is, that the step I'm taking here is an for something called CPS transform, communication style, communic I'm sorry, continuation passing style transform, CPS transform, that explains, um, uh, one level of language by translation into um, essentially a, a, a subset of the same language. So uh, given a um, normal uh, sequential imperative language or a normal uh, object capability language with call return processing with you know, normal stacking, you can explain the call return stacking behavior by translating uh, into the same language, but where you've added an extra parameter to every call, uh, and you've taken at every call site the entire rest of the program and transformed it into a closure that when called will execute the entire rest of the closure, and you pass that as the extra argument. Uh, so the, this closure that represents the rest of the program, the continuation of the program is the continuation object and passing it as the extra argument is the passing style. And the result of the transform is that you're now, uh, you might have thought of it as translating into the same language as the target, but you're using the subset of the language with no call return. You're using it purely as a one-way message passing language uh, that everything only calls, nothing ever returns. Um, and so the, the first, three bullets here correspond to the transparent rewrite that's used only for an explanation where you just transform by adding the extra argument and, and, and transforming. And then the fourth bullet, which uh, uh, the, now, the analogy of the present fourth bullet, which I'll be explaining explicitly, is where you take the explanatory rewrite and you make use of it to add extra expressiveness by introducing a language primitive that can be written manually in the target language, defining a primitive that you then make available to the source language. So in the case of um, continuation passing style, the well-known primitive is call CC. Uh, never mind that I think call CC is a horrible unstructured idea um, for other reasons. Um, uh, and I don't think this one is, is I th and, I, and, and in this case, I think it's a good idea, but that's, that's, uh, um, that's really separate from, from the following the analogy here. Um, so in this case, the analogy uh, comes, the, the remark that uh, Matthew made that inspired this is just to think of what's going on with all of this um, async context stuff as, implicitly passing uh, more parameters through intermediaries that don't see the parameters. Um, and that, that's always been kind of intuitively how I thought of it, intuitively going back to dynamic scoping, one way I've thought about dynamic scoping. But what occurred to me is that we could actually model it in the same way on uh, the first three bullets um, uh, to just transform the language into one that would accommodate 
uh, this extra passing. And then the fourth bullet to introduce Jason's, um, Justin, I'm sorry, Justin's primitive um, as just as code manually written in the target language made available to the source language. So uh, in particular, the uh, notion of extra parameterization should only require passing something forward. There's no use made of um, there, um, you know, the, all the previous uh, takes on uh, async context all had a try catch because we were uh, stacking state and then unstacking state. Um, this one makes no use of try catch because it, all of the explanation of the stacking behavior is just explanation of creating a new, uh, in, a, in a purely functional manner, creating a new object that represents the deeper stack and passing it forward rather than in side affecting anything. Um, so now I see that uh, Justin is showing the, um, so actually Justin, before you do that, let me just, let's go back to the previous slides. I just, just to talk it through um, explicitly the, yeah, that one. Um, so the, uh, the transformation, the rules of the transformation we're gonna use is for every variable name, we're going to, in the source language, we're going to prefix it with an underbar to turn it into a variable name in the target language. Uh, the next transformation is for each function definition in the source language. Uh, we're going to add a new function. We're going to add a new parameter named capital F uh, in the target language. And because the, the identifier capital F in the target language does not begin with an identifier, it cannot, it cannot collide with anything that was originally written as an identifier in the source language. And then finally, uh, for each function call in the target language, we're going to add a, capital, a new capital F argument in the source language, which if we do nothing else, the capital F argument is defined in the lexical scope of a capital F parameter and therefore just passes it through. So the, so the result of the full, first three bullets is that there's simply this extra uh, parameter that gets threaded through everything. And because it's threaded through everything uh, without anything either interfering with it, manipulating it or reading it, it clearly has not yet changed the semantics of the program. Okay, now go on to the, to the uh, code. Okay. So uh, what we do in uh, this slide is we're manually writing a new, a new primitive in the target language, hence the name make async context that's, that's, that's the identifier that we're exporting to the source language. In the, manually writing the target language, we write it with the underbar because make async context in the source language takes no arguments in the target language, it takes this F1 argument. F1, and we're gonna, we're gonna have, we're, since we're manually writing the target language, we can number our different Fs so we can keep them straight. Um, uh, F1 specifically, that's the only mention of it. So it's not actually otherwise used in this code. So it, that's the one that doesn't matter, which makes sense because the, the, the fluid context in which you call make async context that creates a new async context object, a new fluid variable object. Uh, the fluid context of that call, in fact, in Justin's, syntax, Justin's semantics does not matter. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the run method um, uh, being something invocable from the source language in the target language has an extra uh, uh, F parameter, first parameter. Um, and what we do with that first parameter uh, is we use it at, uh, in order to make the F3 parameter, the th F3 argument that we're going to pass. Um, the, uh, scroll down a little bit. Uh, this is the full code slide. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I was, I, I, I was, it was on my, on my cell phone where I wasn't seeing, it. I see it now. Okay, 
So we're gonna make the F3 that we then pass to the callback. So that's the place where we're just using a purely functional style of consing a new thing onto an immutable list to make a bigger immutable list. Uh, in this case, we've taken a notational shortcut, which I, I, I think in retrospect might think, make things more obscure than, than clear things up. But in any case, um, the form of consing is a, a little get function that's parameterized over a, a transposed map. And the important thing about F3 is, well, the harden means that there's no accidental mutability due to the mutability of everything in JavaScript. And the only things it closes over, the only things that that closure captures are key, which is defined two lines above as a, um, as a hardened empty object, which is therefore also transitively immutable and powerless. Uh, and F2, which is the previous such scope, so if F2 is transitively immutable and, hard, and, hard, and powerless, then F3 is transitively immutable and powerless. And since this is the only thing that makes new ones out of old ones, if the first one, which represents the empty fluid context, which no matter what you give it always returns undefined, since that one is naturally transitively immutable and, and powerless, then by induction, all of these are. And that's the reason why this explanation uses the transpose map. So there's two different techniques used in this explanation. One is the, the idea of the defining semantics in terms of a transform to a passing style. And the other one is transposing the map. Uh, the, the key thing about transposing the map is now we can see that in the target language, the only thing that we're passing through that's extra, that's, that's beyond what the programmer wrote in the source language are these transitively immutable and powerless structures. And therefore, if the primitive that we're adding that extended the expressiveness is introducing a danger um, uh, compared to the semantics the programmer thought they were writing in the source language, well, the target language itself is still an object capability language. So the danger can't be beyond what a programmer writing in the target language uh, would have been thinking about. Um, so the, the difference in what the programmer in the source language thinks about and what the programmer in the target language thinks about uh, is this extra um, uh, fluid, fluid scope variable, the F, the F parameters that are being passed through um, which therefore communicate, I, I'm going to say only information, but I'm going to revise that, revise that to observe that it's only, um, it's actually identity, which is less dangerous than information. Um, there, and and I, uh, I realize there's kind of this hierarchy. This is something that goes beyond what I, this is a thought that occurred to me after Fryan. There's kind of this hierarchy of danger, which is, um, uh, ability to cause effects, uh, mutable state, IO, is more dangerous than information, and information is more dangerous than pure identity. So there's, there, so it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive because the ability in object capability language, the ability to cause effects are capabilities, information is just bits, and then unforgeable identity is a capability again. Um, but a uh, but if it's just an identity, it doesn't communicate anything more than information, but it does it in an unforgeable manner so that you don't have to worry about leakage of secrets, that the, the ability to signal a given identity is access limited rather than knowledge limited. Um, uh, so um, so the, the specifics here is that the, um, but the transposed map, which is uh, defined up on line eight, uh, notice that, that there's one transposed map per call to make async context, which means that there's a transposed map per fluid variable, per instance of async context, uh, but independent of 
you know, all of the bindings of the same fluid variable all share the same transposed map. So it's per, it's per fluid variable, but independent of time. And then it's inside the call to run that we, that we um, create the key. So the key is the thing that's temporally dependent. So then when we do the get on line 17, the get where, you, where it's, you're passing in the hidden fluid scope, uh, it then, the fluid scope is just, is, is at the, uh, in the target language is this get operation, which is applied to the transposed map, uh, which represents the fluid variable. And what it's doing is the get is adding the temporal information, which is uh, get me the value that's according to the, um, the most recent binding of, well, the, the current binding of the, um, I would call it recursion. So it's, you're performing yeah. this function essentially. And the most recent map, which is the highest level of the recursion is the one that we have just defined with F3. Uh, and F2 being the prior, so the, any temporal information that happened before. Yeah, good. Okay, and as we know so far, since we have not yet introduced wrap, we're only still explaining no more than um, normal synchronous fluid scoping that you could have written safely at the user level. So we've explained it in terms of this extra parameter, but we haven't introduced any semantics that you could not have written by other means directly in an object capability source language. Okay, now the wrap beginning on line 23 is where the magic happens. And the magic is that on line 30, the when the when you know, so so wrap takes a function and returns a new function that's doing the dynamic equivalent of or the temporal equivalent of closure capture. Uh, and I, I think I have a slightly better way of explaining why why closure capture is so powerful and why it's the right analogy. A better explanation than I had at Fry M which is when you're in a given lexical context, you have certain powers by virtue of being in that lexical context. And what closure capture allows you to do is to be able to use at a later time, the powers that you had as I'm sorry, in a, in a able to use in a separate context the powers that you had by virtue of being in that context. So in lexical and in, in with lexical closures, with lexical closure capture, it's just that the function that uh, had access to various um, uh, lexical bindings by virtue of being defined in a given. Um, a lexical context is able to preserve those bindings so that it can use them when it's later invoked after that, um, that lexical context has otherwise gone away. Uh, the temporal, uh, what, what RAP is doing is, is, um, is definitely trickier, um, but it's saying that uh, if you understand the synchronous fluid scoping, which once again is not magic, as because I'm executing in a given temporal context, I have certain powers. Um, the powers that, was, that, that were made available to me explicitly by use of the async context API um, uh, uh, of, the, of that subset of the special powers I have because of my temporal context, let me delegate to my future self the ability to use those powers later, exactly the powers that I have now. Um, so the, the key thing here is that uh, 
Uh, on 29 is the wrapper function that is then invoked later. And when the wrapper function is invoked, it, it then invokes the wrapped function on line 30, but it passes to the wrapped function F5. And F5 rather than F6. F6 is the temporal context in which the wrapper was invoked. F5 is the temporal function in which the wrapped function was wrapped to create the wrapper. So we're restoring the, the, the temporal scope during which wrap was called. So when the wrapper is called from the point of view of the fluid scoping, it's as if the wrapped function was called during the call to wrap, uh, only for you know, only with regard to understanding what's going on with fluid scoping. It's as if it's going on at that time. So what that's saying is that the temporal relationships that you're expressing using Justin's API explicitly is a form of time that you're allowing the user to rearrange in a particular manner by using wrap. Um, and uh, that's, that's it, that's, that's my explanation. Um, I'm gonna just scroll up. Um, so to, to recap, essentially, it's a transform. Um, all that you are able to access as a user of the language is this. Notice that there's no F variables, there's no fluid scoping ability for you to directly access any of the closed over fluid scopes. Um, once we do the post transform, the fluid scope finally appears and every call and every function receives a fluid scope. And if you want to interact with it in any way, you must use the async context API, which has access to, to the fluid scope, the current fluid scope at the time of whenever you call it. Um, and so if you were to run, you pass in an initial state and you get a brand new state out, which will wrap the current value. Uh, and when you call get at some point in the future, it depends on whichever fluid scope you're currently wrapping. Uh, and so that's the way that we define. Essentially, it's uh, define a way of having a global state that does not itself expose any extra data to it and which will eventually go away as soon as the current whatever the getter is assigned to uh, goes away as soon as the closure is no longer able to access the fluid scope anymore. Right, it goes away simply by virtue of the fact that F3 is only passed forward uh, outside of that one use of F3, the, the, the rest of the, the, that context only ever mentions F2. So, mm -hmm. um, so there, that's why there's no side effects needed, no pushing and popping needed in an imperative manner, and therefore no try finally needed. Um, are there any questions on this? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm a follow all. Um, so with these, what are the changes on the Arena proposal then? I don't believe there are any. Uh, this is just another way of thinking about the original proposal in a way that would uh, explain it with less global state, essentially. Yeah, this is my, my, my third attempt to understand the original proposal in the context of, um, of trying to map it to object capability concepts so that I can reason about what risk it introduces. And the risks it introduces are only, I, th I think are now clearly only information leakage. You cannot possibly introduce authority leakage, permission leakage, ability to cause effects. Uh, and, and therefore the attack that, that, we, sh that we showed last week remains, um, uh, I think, representative of how narrow the attack surface is here with regard to um, a code written in the source language that's not sufficiently aware of the additional dangers. I mean, let's take Carol, the, the hypothetical Carol in the attack. 
which is code written in the source language completely unaware that this new primitive has been added. Um, the only way in which Carol can suffer is that uh, Alice and Bob can communicate to each other only information that they could have communicated to each other otherwise because they're calling each other, but information which isn't apparent to Carol as an intermediary um, uh, watching how they're communicating to each other. So one of Justin's defenses is for Carol to use new primitives to reveal to herself difference in how Alice and Bob interacted with each other. Uh, and that kind of reveals why this attack is so narrow and, and therefore why for existing object capability code, uh, why it is so little of a threat to enhance the language with this new API. Uh, and in fact, I'll just repeat the claim that as far as I can tell from thinking about all of the object capability code that I've written over many decades, over most of my career, and all of the object capability code that I've been exposed to, I actually can't think of any code whose, sec whose intended security properties would be broken if Justin's primitive was added as in, in this manner as a new primitive into the language in which that code had been written with that code being unaware of it. And that's a pretty strong statement. Uh, thank you. Um, does that answer your question, Carity? Yes. All right. Uh, it sounds like, a, I mean, it's a compelling explanation. Um, I think that we can call this week unless there's anything else we would like to discuss. All right. Thank you for attending the SES meeting. So an additional issue that's a remaining controversy on the proposal thread that I think this fluid passing style uh, explanation speaks to is, is the fluid scope, is the fluid scoping mechanism per realm or per agent? Um, when it was explained by a, a, a um, outer top level shared mutable variable, uh, Justin's uh, Dunderbar storage variable, uh, you know, you, it was that sort of naturally um, led, you know, could lead to uh, expecting it to be per realm, certainly cross realm shared mutable state would be an extremely dangerous thing to traffic in. Um, but the, uh, but since the, the, the call return stack is shared across all realms in the same agent. And the promise job queue is shared between all realms in the same agent. All of the temporal issues that this thing is, is about is kind of per agent, not per realm. Um, and if you take, if, if we had um, uh, uh, key, um, symbols as weak map keys, uh, then the fluid scoping with the keys being symbols rather than empty objects, which I saw in the uh, chat from Richard. Um, uh, the, the, the key thing about the symbols is that it passes through even the shadow realm boundary. Um, uh, if we explained it in terms of that, and with the transpose maps, the transpose, because of the transpose, none of the mutable state is ever cross realm. Uh, the only thing that would ever be communicated cross realm are these are these um, f values, which are just um, uh, you know uh, uh, functional lists of symbols to be looked up. Um, I think that uh, helps 
make peace with the idea that this should actually be a per, per agent scoping mechanism rather than a per realm scoping mechanism. Uh, that would actually help. So I originally chose per realm because it's the simplest to explain in JavaScript and I don't have to do anything in order to, to make it work. Um, and it also, when I was doing the DNet proposal, it was told that I was told that I needed to make it per realm um, so that there wasn't any information sh shared. Um, having it be per agent instead is actually going to make it easier for browsers. Uh, they will be able to interact with the current storage state uh, easier because they don't have to worry about which context the code that is currently running came from inside of their agent. If you have like an iframe that has shared a direct reference to a function from an outer realm, from another realm, they don't have to worry about it anymore. It's just it, because it has access, it's all same agents and they can just snapshot it. It also helps with browsers for uh, native host code that doesn't have JavaScript semantics directly. Uh, apparently they can't just get the current context of the whatever JavaScript is running into. Uh, so if they can have it be per agent instead, then it doesn't have any of that complication. They don't have to worry about the JavaScript realm. Okay. Um, and the, so, so what do you, well, so, so good, I think we're all in agreement. Um, what do you think of having the, um, the canonical explanation of the semantics be this fluid passing style explanation? Um, I mean, that's fine with me. I think it complicates it. As, a, as someone trying to look at the proposal, I don't think it's straightforward. Um, the only reason I understand this is because I've read through this PR several times in order to, to understand the transform maps that happen the um in the work from the original my proposal to the explained proposal and it doesn't quite carry why it needs to be that complicated essentially as a security model yes i, I could add a security uh document onto it and go through all the steps but i don't okay. think the um I, I don't think the initial explanation should be this complicated because it's not targeted at security folks. It's more like me as a JavaScript, basic JavaScript developer, what does this thing do? Okay, the, the, the one the, a particular reason is as long as it was explained in terms of mutable state, especially shared mutable state, mm -hmm. I felt very conflicted about the idea of suggesting that it was per agent uh, because realms really need to stay isolated from each other. Mm -hmm. um, but with the fluid scoping explanation, it just seems very natural for it to be per agent. Okay. Um, I understand. Um, yeah, I can do that. It reminds me that Daniel Ehrenberg was talking about using functional immutable data structures for the uh, for behind the scenes implementations and engines, and it's uh, which would be potentially useful for a um, multi-agent multi implementation um, in a way that it relieves the concern of like right barriers. Yeah, so the initial, the code that I have currently um, solves that by never mutating a map a second time. As right. soon as you create the map, there's an initial mutation to it. And then that map is permanently frozen essentially. Um, yeah. So that if you have ever have access to a map, you know it's exactly the map that was created and can't have changed. Um, yeah, it's the classic. Uh, it's the classic uh, gentleman's agreement of immutability. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it's actually mostly. immutable because it's just a regular JavaScript map object. But it, by usage of the map, you know it's immutable uh, in, in practice. Um, yeah, and, the, and, the, and that and that explanation is has, is a little bit more complicated with the transposed map is essentially. Uh, still works, which is uh, it's no longer that it's the map that is only changed once. It is uh, the binding of a map and a key to a value uh, mm -hmm. that is only only ever happens at the moment the key is created. So for the same key, it's never going to be bound in uh, to. It's never going to be bound. It's only going to be bound in one map, and it's 
never going to be bound to another value. Yeah. I mean, we could look for trouble. <clears throat> I wonder whether any extent JavaScript implementations implement their maps by backed with a splay tree. <laughs> splay trees are uh, uh, mutate their internal data structure on read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so does uh, um, hardware memory caching. Cache lines mutate on read. <laughs> all right, uh, I think that I we can we can actually call the meeting now, and I'll figure out how to splice videos together. All right, okay. thank you.